Church and the Holy Gospel according to the Evangelist St. Luke. Glory to the Lord. spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the Lord. Please be seated. Welcome to the celebration of the Sunday of the Feast of the Pharisee and the Publican. We're continuing our journey and our preparation towards Lent. Today, we consider two men. Two men with one common purpose. Their purpose was to go up to the temple and to pray. They had a single purpose, a single activity in mind going up to the temple, and that was indicative of the fact that they were going to a place where God's presence was manifest. The holy temple was the holiest geographic location in the world, not just the holiest place in Israel, but in the world. It was a place that had been sanctified by God's very presence and proven by many miracles in that place. And so it was that they went to a right geographic place together to pray to seek God, to do something in his presence. When they were there, their goal was, as the Lord states at the end of this, was to be justified. And so it was that two men went up to the temple to pray with very different results. And so it's those results today that we seek to learn from as we think about the whole issue of prayer. Two men went up to the temple to pray. There's two things about prayer that we see in this little parable by the Lord. Number one, there's a place of prayer. And also we see in the stature of the men and the way they approach the Lord, the issue of how we approach the Lord himself. These two men went to a good place. They went to the temple, but they went there with very different attitudes. And so I guess it is that we should start off by identifying exactly, trying to define a little bit, what is prayer? If I ask one of you to stand up right now, you who frequent the temple, could you give me a good definition of prayer? Do you want me to call on anybody? <laughs> I think not. Well, simply put, prayer is supposed to be dialogue with God. That means there's two people involved. There's you and there's God involved. But at a deeper level, prayer is something more. The ancient and traditional kind of understanding of prayer is that it's the lifting up of the heart and the mind unto God, of standing in his presence, of being constantly aware of him and in remembrance of his name, of his existence, of his power and his love. This is the kind of prayer which is also spoken of as walking with God or walking in God. An awareness of God, that he's there, that he cares, that you need him, that he has something to offer you, and that more importantly, he's holy, he's omnipotent, and he's God. He holds your life in the palm of his hand. So the definition starting, which we would look at today of prayer, is that we're coming to God to speak with God, to dialogue to God, to be in his presence, to somehow walk with him. And so it is when we seek to expand upon that, what does that really mean? Because so often I think we get a narrow view of prayer, that, that prayer is like when we go to our icon corner or we sit there with our hands folded and we say some words to God. Prayer is far more than that. And so I would read from St. Isaac the Syrian to point our eyes to the greater kind of efficacy of prayer, but also to the, all the means by which we enter into prayer and by which we come into this dialogue with God, in which we come into his presence. So St. Isaac was speaking about prayer, and he said this. He said, 
Delight during prayer is different from vision during prayer. So he's speaking about something which is kind of great. Not just like saying, God bless my food. He's speaking about a place where prayer takes us into a vision and to a delight in prayer. He says the latter, which is the vision, is superior to the former, just as a fully grown man is superior to a small child. And then he's going to show us a lot of things about prayer, how we get into prayer. He says sometimes biblical verses themselves will grow sweet in the mouth, and the simple phrase of prayer is repeated innumerable times without one having had enough of it and wanting to pass on to another. Have you ever meditated on Scripture and got into the sense that God was with you, He was speaking to you, and your heart was full of those words that you just read? It's a form of prayer. God's teaching us what prayer is through St. Isaac. And sometimes out of prayer, he says, contemplation is born. This cuts prayer off from the lips, and the person who beholds this is like a corpse without soul and wonder. We call this the faculty of vision and prayer. It does not consist in any image or portrayable form, as foolish people say. This contemplation and prayer also has its degrees and different gifts, but up to this point, it is still prayer. For though it is not yet passed into the state where it is non-prayer, there is something even more excellent than prayer. So prayer is a tunnel, if you will, to all different levels of communion with God. It's more than just words. It goes beyond words. And it can get to a place where it's beyond prayer. Prayer truly is complex. And it's multifaceted. The movements of the tongue and of the heart during prayer act as the keys. This is important when we think about the two men just a minute. The movements of the tongue and of the heart during prayer of the keys. What comes after these is the actual entry into the treasury. From this point onward, mouth and tongue become still to the heart, the treasure of the thoughts, the mind, the governor of the senses, and the bold spirit, that swift bird, along with all the means and uses they possess. Request to sees here, for the master of the house is come. The goal of prayer is to be in God's presence. To be truly in God's presence. And there's so many ways we can get there beyond our formal prayer, beyond even words. There's prayer when there's communion with God and we're in his presence and we sense his majesty and we sense his awe and his ability to deliver what we need and what we ask for. So this definition of prayer has to be upon our thoughts as we enter into a look at these two men. So one comes in to this place of God, his presence, but he leaves out his most important part of approach to God, which is his heart. He comes into this place of God's presence in the holy temple with words alone. He prays, it says, with himself, indicating that the dialogue of prayer or the presence of God realistically in his heart was not there. He was only alone in his words, which weren't prayer. He was there with himself. And he says these words, God, I thank you. I'm not as other men are. And he lists some very interesting sins. Extortion, being unjust, adulterers. And then he points in his mind to the public and says, as is public. And what public would be a thief, perhaps, or a covetous person of money. He lists some sins. And he says, I'm not like that. I'm not a sinner like that man. He didn't see his own sin. He made his own list of sins. I think if we made a list of bad sins up, it wouldn't include any of the sins that we do. It would be somebody else's sins. Oh, that person there, he's a drunk, he beats his wife, he's a drug addict, he swears all the time, he steals, whatever. Anything we don't do is bad. Well, that's what the public was like when he came there with a cold heart. He came not understanding something, that before God, we are all doomed. We're all filthy. We're sinful. We're unclean. We've all failed. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, as the scripture says. And so he had a false view of himself. And he had a false view of God. And this allowed him to go into a place, the temple, the very holiest place on earth, and utter words. But these words were not prayer. He looked also, and he said, of the good things that he'd done, as if that would somehow outweigh his bad and wipe her waste. I fast twice in the week. I've got great physical discipline. Perhaps you're like that. You've got great physical discipline. And you laud it. I give tithes of all that I possess. I'm a generous person. No mention in his own heart, in his own words, 
of really his state before God. Fallen and unjust. Well, it's a sad thing to come to the place of prayer and not be in the right place. He came to this temple, this earthly temple, but he left his heart behind. So often I think our prayer is like that. We're like this man, that we're in a place where we're supposed to be praying, but we're not praying. Because our heart is disengaged. Our heart is not appraised of reality. Our heart doesn't look at God. We can be standing in a place of prayer, in an icon corner, in a church, in a holy place, be far from the place of prayer. And so it was that he wasn't in the right place, and his heart was where prayer occurs. The kingdom of God is in you, the Lord says. And he says this, he says, if I regard iniquity on my heart, in the Psalms, David wrote this, the Lord won't hear me. If you ever think of this, the old phrase that you hear, your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, this is a perfect example of a place where a man went to pray, but his prayers were bouncing on the ceiling. God wasn't hearing him because of his iniquity, and he wasn't in a place where the kingdom of God was in his heart. He was absent. But there's another man in the story who comes quite differently. He's the publican, and he shows us something about the place of the heart truly being involved is the place of prayer. But he also shows us something about the approach to prayer, which is so important also. How we approach God matters to God, and it matters to us. Because if we want to be in communion with God, we've got to come God's way. We don't choose the way we come. And so it was, the public comes. And the Lord Jesus, remember, is telling us this parable for our instruction. He's saying this man came, this publican, known to be a sinner. Publicans weren't very popular. I know what publicans would be like in the United States. Anybody have an idea what a publican would be like? Who consider, who's about to consider the lowest of the low, but they actually have a pretty high position? Maybe a politician. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. But anyway, the publican came and noticed his approach. He came into this building, this magnificent structure, this temple, but his heart kept him back from boldness. His cart kept him, so that he stood afar off, it says. He didn't come right up to the front of the altar and stand there and raise his hand and see how great he was. He stood afar off, feeling even unworthy to enter into such a holy place. He stood afar off, and it says he wouldn't so much as lift his eyes up into heaven. I think that when the rich man came in, the other man, he came right to the front of the church, he, he, would, he would have gone right into the throne room of the very God himself to physically be present there. He had no fear, no, no nervousness about being in God's presence. No, no idea of how God, holy God is. The prophet Isaiah fell on his face and dead. and said, I'm a, I'm a sinful man in the midst of a sinful people before God. He was greater than any of us. This man... One man would go right to the front, the other man would stand way in the back. And he wouldn't even so much as lift his eyes up into heaven, let alone go into the heavens. And think he was worthy of being God's presence. His eyes were down. He stood afar off, wouldn't even look up. And we see as he smites in his breast the engagement of the heart with the body. We believe that both need to be engaged. He was beating on him, he was crying. His emotions were were expressing the reality of his heart, that he was broken before God. He was weak before God. He was needy before God. And he stood there, and everything about his being and his presence, both within and without, indicated that reality. His view of God is great. His view of himself is nothing. This is the attitude that brings us into the proper approach to pray. This is what this man possessed. The Lord says here that that man went down justified. St. Isaac wrote a little bit about this approach idea. And I wanted to read just a short little piece here too. It shows so well the engagement of the heart with the emotions, the mind, the will, all in view of how great God is. This is what he says about this approach. He says, 
Once a person has become humble, straightway, mercy encircles and embraces him. And once mercy is approached, immediately his heart becomes aware of God helping him, since he discovers a certain powerful assurance stirring within him. This is what God does for us when we come to him with humility. I'd say it's part of almost every single encounter that a person has with God, from their conversion to their death and everything in between. When we come to God and recognize who God is and how great he is, we are acceptable to him. No matter what state we might have been as we walk to that place, when we come there, we're acceptable. Whether it's in repentance or thanksgiving or whatever, we see the greatness of God. We truly see it. And we embrace it. Our heart is encaptured by that. Then we're great. We're in humility. We're in state. Jesus tells us himself. His very own words tell us. I tell you, he says, not written by somebody else. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified, not the other. Being just before God means being in a good place. We won't get into justification. We guess what other sermon. But being just, declared by God to be just, I want to hear that. We should all want to hear that. How great it is to have the words of God himself say, you're justified. All these good things being declared just came from that humility, that approach to God, and, and the approach in the place of the heart, being together, unified, in a real version of the reality of who God is and what we are. And so it was that today we have to consider where we are. The Lord says through the Apostle Paul in Corinthians that, that you are the temple of God. He says, and the temple of God is holy, he says, which temple you are. The kingdom of God truly lies within us. And so when we pray in our hearts, we're in the temple. We're in the place we need to be in. And God's able to hear our prayer if we're in that state of humility and repentance we need to be in. Truly, I pray that this Lent, as we go through Lent, that God will allow us the opportunity somehow to get in this place where our heart is in tune with him where we recognize how great he is and how little we are, and we're blessed by him, by communion truly with the living God who could declare us just according to his will. May God have it so. May our Lenten journey be like this man, this man that went into the temple to pray in the right place of heart and with the right approach to God. May God help us to be like that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.